Hello and welcome to this episode of the Zoom Room Sessions. I'm David Francis Moore and today we are with filmmaker Ty O'Sullivan. Ty, thanks for joining us on the Zoom Room Sessions today. Thank you very much for having me. It's nice to, uh, it's nice to be here. Art itself can be that language, you know, and that, that's, that's the most powerful art comes out of art itself being the language of art. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That the it, art is all about people connecting and communicating. Um, so if you're going to talk about a language to, talk, to use in relation to art, it's already there. It is art. That's what art is. That's what filmmaking is. It's what poetry is. It's a, it's a way of joining two people's minds or one person's minds and many minds. Um, and, and that has to be front and center to take, you know, I don't want to go down a critical road, but if you, if you do go into a, a business led kind of arena or world where, where people talk about art in a very business sense, and it's all about agile and robust responses to, you know, going forward, like that's the opposite of art, you know, cause it's it stripped that language, that language that's used is stripped mostly of meaning, you know, cause words like agile and robust actually don't mean anything at all. Um, and it's also stripped entirely of ambiguity, which is the absolute lifeblood of art. You know, that I look at a film and I see something entirely different to what you see. And that, that's it, that's the point, um, is that we can then get something different from, from art, because it's not specific. Um, and whereas the language of business aspires to specificity, it aspires to clarity and non-ambiguity. So it's kind of, it's, it's just fundamentally wrong. It's the fundamentally wrong register to be speaking in when you're speaking about art. You cannot describe art using that language. Um, you can describe something else, which is a really solid budget and finance plan for making your film. Great. Um, and you need that because I don't want a poem instead of a finance plan if I'm getting a film made. You know, there's no point in a deeply ambiguous impressionistic spreadsheet. But each, it has to have its place. Uh, and, I, and I think that's where we have to be kind of guarded is to, to, for, for, to know that the way that we as artists use language and that the way that we understand language um, is not wrong. It's not a secondary sort of argo. It is, that's what it's about. The other stuff should sort of be deferential to it. You know what I mean? Um, I guess I, I would try not to describe myself as a professional. I, yeah, I mean, it, I guess I am a professional artist. Um, I think, I think that whether, whether as a filmmaker, as an artist, you know, because I, I do a lot of different types of work. I do sound work, I do bits of writing, I do filmmaking. Um, and in a previous life, I used to want to, to be a product designer. Um, when coming out of a degree I, I did in engineering um, and the kind of through line you know because these are all slightly unconnected disconnected things um, through line is that I would I've always dreamt of working on my own terms you know um, the ability to to make work that you believe in whatever that might be um, that is some kind of contribution to the world, be that a chair you design or a film that you make or a poem that you write, whatever. Um, if you can do that and you can in some shape or form put a roof over your head, whether that's a leaky roof or a nice roof, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, but if you can put a roof over your head by making work that's on your own terms, um, that speaks to you and that allows you to to connect with other people through the work and in the making of the work, you know, so just to, to communicate through the work to an audience, but also to connect with people in the making of the work, people that you collaborate with, people that you know within a particular industry or, or, or arts world. Um, if you can do all that and put a roof over your head whilst doing so, that to me is both my ambition and 
what I would consider to be a success. Um, and, and that's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, the particulars of, of, do I want to make this kind of film or that kind of film or, you know, that, that's all secondary, you know, I think, I think having this kind of creative impulse is something that I think an awful lot of people have. Um, having something that you feel you have to say to the world um, uh, or, or say out, think out loud and have the world maybe listen. Um, that's kind of the artistic impulse. If you can scratch that itch and, like I say, put a roof over your head whilst doing so, that to me is quite pretty good. Um, and, and it's all I would ever really aspire to. Um, so... Yeah, I mean the roof is getting slightly nicer as the years go by, and the um, the, the itch is getting less itchy. <laughs> but but the kind of the, the basic kind of motivating element is remains the same, uh, I think. So. Um, like for me, uh, I think a lot of artists are fundamentally shy people. Um, but they're not just any old shy people, they're shy people who have a deep desire to connect to other people, um, but don't necessarily have the same social outlet that other people have. Um, and, and I think for, for that, for, for such people, um, connecting with people through art is a very important element of what they do. And like I said in the last, in relation to the last question, um, there's kind of this, vertical connection uh, which is with your with somebody who might see your work or uh, viewers audience people that that kind of thing but then there's this horizontal connection as well with people that you collaborate with people that you work with people that you know within the same area who and you talk about the industry you talk about work you talk about films you've seen and you share ideas you know so so there's that side of things um so and then within film What's very interesting in nonfiction documentary film, which is where I ended up gravitating towards far more than fiction film, um, you get to walk around the world um, and talk to people that you wouldn't otherwise get to talk to. Um, you get to carry a microphone like this um, <laughs> and you put it in front of people and you get to ask them all sorts of interesting questions. Um, and that's an incredible privilege. Uh, and it's an incredible way for somebody who maybe is a little bit reticent uh, and shy. It's an incredible way to go out and meet the world um, and to, to ask questions and, um, and not necessarily have to answer questions in turn, you know, because it's a bit of a one-way street. Um, so, so you're asking kind of what's the arena for the work. For me, it's, it's really multifaceted. You know, it's, it's knowing you through my engagement with arts in Carlo. It's, it's, it's about knowing, uh, knowing a fellow who, who traveled from Turkey to Greece on a dinghy um, as a refugee because I was making a film about that particular thing once upon a time. Um, it's about meeting people in Berlin that have seen a, a film of mine and hated it, but that's a good starting point for a conversation. Um, so, you know, I'm not interested in, in work. It's all about people. You know what I mean? That's what I'm trying to say that, that, that for me, art can be beautiful. Um, but what's interesting to me is the mind of the person who created that beauty and connecting with that mind. Even if the person died 200 years ago, it's still about that person and connecting with that person's mind. Um, and I think art stripped of the, of the human um, is kind of hollow and, and a bit boring. So, so for me, the, the realm that I work in is all about humans and engaging with humans. Um, which is what something that I'm kind of struggling with in the current context because it's all mediated through uh, this kind of digital remove. Um, and I'm kind of curious about what that does to art and does it like, does it change it? But maybe that's a, another conversation, I don't know. Um, Yes, 
There's a couple of things around this. Like, I think there's a really important part of my work, which is to do with community. Um, like I spent time in Galway a long time ago, like it's uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and I was part of a kind of a, a bunch of people, a bunch of friends who were interested in the same kind of films, the same kind of work. Um, and we all stayed friends for a long time. And, uh, and even though we wouldn't necessarily work on, on each other's films, even though we did sometimes, um, there was a sense of, oh, I, I, of sending each other our films in order to see what that person thought, or did you see this person's work, or have you read this book, or, you know, just a general kind of sense of community. And, and that's lasted a long time and it's grown and it's, it's, I've, I've had it replicated in slightly different ways with other friends and newer friends. And so that kind of sense of working in a scene as it were, for all that word is not a great word, um, I think is really important. I think you can't make work in a vacuum. Um, and that to me is, is the key collaborative thing is because a lot of art is about developing a language, you know, a language of, of filmmaking, a language of writing, you know, a language of music. Um, and if, and you develop language is a social thing. You know, if I know that I can create work in a certain style and it will be appreciated or understood more to the point by other people, that will encourage me to, to work in that way. So mm -hmm. it's it definitely people's ideas bounce and feed off each other. Um, and there's nothing radical in observing that, you know, I mean, just look at the schools of painting in the 15th century, like to observe how that has always been the case. Um, so that's really important to me. Um, in the specifics of film, film is a very collaborative, um, it's a very collaborative medium, you know, just watch the credits for any film, like there's literally hundreds of people working on it. Um, but collaboration in film is very expensive um, because if you want to film something, you can pay somebody X per day and it's a lot, X is a big number in that. Um, or you can just figure out how to do it yourself. And I've always been a believer in, I'll figure it out and I'll do it myself, or I'll work with one particular person who, who I really trust and we're good friends. And so a lot of my early or early work was made with tiny uh, teams um, and the credits would be embarrassingly short. It would be, you know, everything, Tiger Sullivan, camera, Fergie Ward. And, and that would almost show you up as being some kind of poor person who can't afford to employ a proper boom operator. Um, but it was just a way that I had, it was a priority thing. Like if I had resources, be that money or anything else, I wanted to make sure that it went into the film um, rather than, 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 than spending it uh, on, on people that I couldn't really afford. Um, and, I, and also, I don't mind filming something for a month rather than only having the money to pay somebody to try and film it in three days when you just won't get the same depth of engagement. So that's kind of the other aspect of film. Um, and I enjoy that and I enjoy the autonomy of it. Um, but as the years went on, I began to, to collaborate more. And the most recent film that I made, um, which is I'm just finishing now, which is a feature film about the moon um, and moonlight, uh, and the credits are a mile long um, because we were working with cinematographers in uh, China and um, poets in North America. And it was a really, really collaborative thing where I would just find somebody on the internet um, whose work I liked and I'd approach them and say, uh, would you like to film something for this film and give you total autonomy within this kind of brief um, and then send me back the material and we'll see what we have. Um, and it was incredibly uh, interesting way to work. And sometimes it was useless, terrible. People would just send it back total crap. But other times, most of the time, it would come back and you'd be really surprised and you'd go, oh, Jesus, that's, I'd never have thought of doing that myself. That somebody's totally surprised me here. Um, and that was a real eye opener, you know, uh, as far as the power of collaboration and the power of, using an idea um, and much as I said about connecting with somebody's mind uh, in an audience you know you, you've got the film is here and your mind is here the film is here and the audience's mind is here and you're using the film as a way to connect with that person 
in the same way I think collaboration can be the idea of the film is here my mind is here and your mind is here and we'd use the idea of the film as a way to connect um, emotionally intellectually whatever else um, and it can be incredibly uh, rewarding I mean other times you will just get somebody on the end of the phone on the end of the zoom meeting and they're just looking at you going so what do you want me to film um, and you're like, well, maybe nothing, because you just don't get it. Um, and that's fine, too. But, but sometimes when somebody just goes, I, I kind of see what you mean. And they'll mention some, could be a painting or a poem or a song or something that they go, is it kind of, that's the atmosphere that you're looking for? I, I know what you're at. And then you have this moment when you, when you get the material back and it's great. And you just go, oh, I love this person. Um, and it's a real, it's, again, it's going back to the thing I've been talking about. It's about connecting. Um, connect mm, no, to be honest. Um, because I, I think the word entrepreneur is, is I, I don't even know what it means myself. Like, I think... I think you just need a different word. I think that word is is hollowed out a little bit, and and just a, just any kind of meaning has been squeezed out of it from overuse. Um, I mean, I, I understand what it means, but I would never use it in relation to myself. I would never really use it in relation to anybody because it carries with it certain sort of connotations, which I don't think are that helpful. Um, I don't have an alternative. Um, but, uh, and maybe I'm being a little bit too cynical there myself, but I think, yeah, I, th I, th I think words like independence, uh, words like, um, creative, also a bit of a hollowed out word. I don't know. I mean, maybe we should all just start speaking Irish and just move away from all these hollowed out words. Um, because I'm sure if you spoke about it in Irish, you wouldn't necessarily ca carry the baggage of words like entrepreneurship i don't know mm, um yeah I, I can't argue like if if you if i was into if if somebody asked me to interview somebody for a, an important job um, and that was the checklist. I could see the merits of using it, um, but I wouldn't, it's like that, it just doesn't come into my brain, you know what I mean? Like I, what was the second one? There was the second or third one was some weird. Creativity. Yeah, that's a given. What was the next one? Uh, valuing ideas. Yeah, no, opportunity, ability to spot an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, sorry but fuck that um like that's just kind of uh, that's business people talk you know what i mean that's that's ah uh, yeah i can i can sell i can sell hand sanitizer in the current climate you know like um or or seeing that like basketball films are really big at the moment because of the last dance so i'm going to make a basketball film like go away like you know uh, the, the world is full of people like that you know we don't need to advocate for that in our in our creative um in our creative world i i think quite the opposite you know i i would value somebody who barely knows what the opportunities are are, are that are out there who just wants to make a particular thing and you know because it's it's up to the system to listen to the people you know what i mean it's up to the system to to go you know rather than we'd like to encourage this type of art um it's up to to those people uh you know when i'm talking about funders and arts organizations and people like that um and a lot of them do uh to kind of check in with people and and say especially the young people you know people in their 20s just starting out what are they making you know what i mean like what 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 do they do and I think filmmaking is a really interesting um, subject. I mean, it's the one I know most about, but like filmmaking is in for a big land when the current crop of 20 somethings uh, are slightly older. 
Uh, filmmaking is predicated on, a, on an industry, on a business model that is all about individual niche skills. Um, you know, you train as a this or that or the other. Um, it's, it's based on, you know, big budgets being required for films, producers, accountants, everybody's involved. You have 22 year olds who are doing stuff on TikTok at the moment. That is way, way beyond what I see at film festivals. Uh, and I'm not even joking. Like, I think there are people, there are 17 year olds in Poland at the moment. And I'm speaking as about a specific person um, making work that I think is some of the most original cinematic work I've seen in years. Um, so if the film industry then is going, we'd like to encourage these competencies, you're missing the boat. You need to, you, the incompetency I would advocate for the film industry is to go on TikTok, go on YouTube, go and listen to young people and see what it is that they're making and make sure that when they come out of, you know, their youth, even now, make sure that there's a, a space for them to grow into in your industry or else your industry is going to die. Um, you know, and, and I think that the same goes for music, the same goes for literature, the same, you know, it is up to the people who run the industry uh, to, to make themselves, they should be the malleable ones. They should be the ones changing their competencies to facilitate that which is bubbling up from inside of people. Do you know what I mean? Because all art, all good art proceeds from something that is a feeling here. Um, and the feeling here that 18 year olds are having about uh, living in lockdown for four months is not something that the art world can, can throw a frame around and say, you know, here's an open call for blah, blah, blah. Um, unless they listen, unless they go and read what people are writing on the internet, on Twitter, on social media. And, you know, you can tune into that now in a way that you never could before. And, and art needs to, the art industry, the art business, um, needs to facilitate and create a space for that which is bubbling up from below. And if that means the end of certain established artists' careers, so be it. You know, like if, if the art world has to move on, if, if the film world has to move on, you know, and you see, because you see this in, in music a lot, you know, the Glastonbury and, um, you know, the O2 Arena and all of these, they're every set, almost every second set is by white dudes in their 50s playing the same records that white dudes in their 40s liked when they were 18. Um, and so the film industry has, has said, well, the money is in people who look like Tygo Sullivan spending money going to recreate their youth, um, listening to the bands that he used to like. Um, so that's, that's, where the, that's where an industry led model of the arts leads you is a kind of absolute calcification and stagnation rather than um rather than creating a stage which is entirely about new uh new voices and things that are just brilliant and and you can't deny that they're brilliant which is where all those bands came from in the first place was somebody going that's really good um and in 1987 people were like, okay, clear the stage. This guy's amazing. Give him a stage. You know, and I think going back to that is, is where the arts it needs to, needs to go. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, you put, I put a, a tremendous jealous value on my time, to be honest. Um, I don't necessarily work in the same way that other people, that everybody works. I don't work, I work well at night. I work well at the weekend. I work well when it's quiet and there's no emails coming in. Um, whereas I, so I'm quite sort of protective about how I, how I manage my time because uh, I can't just, chop it out and say I'll do the work between nine and lunchtime on Wednesday. Um, I find that very difficult. So, so I, I can be quite, uh, yeah, quite protective about the time that I get because I'm not sure when I'm going to hit a rhythm with something or, or, or really get into a flow of working. Um, 
and I actually allow that to happen when it happens. Um, I don't have kids. I don't have um, like a very sort of externally framed life um, in the way that, so I can still do that. Um, but I still do it, you know, I still value it. Um, the film industry is full of people, is full of very specific models of paying people in relation to time. So it'll be like editing costs X per week. Uh, cinematography is X per day. That's, that's the way it works, which is the way a lot of industries obviously work. Um, but it means then that your, the relationship between work and time uh, can be a strange one because even if I'm editing for an entire day, I might get nothing done. Um, but then I'll go back to it at night and in the space of an hour, I'll do a full day's work, you know, or what you could pretend you took you a day. Um, so, but you don't get paid more for that. You know, you don't get paid for doing brilliant work, you know, um, and yeah, and that's an odd thing, you know, it can be an odd thing. Um, stubbornness, I would say, um, you know, and by that I mean just kind of going, no, I, I, I want to do it this way. Um, yeah, stubbornness and an ability to, to, to learn, you know, or, or not so much to learn, but to figure something out, you know, like by way of example, um, sound mixing is something that gets done at the end of a film where you, you go into a studio and it's all sliders and faders and mastering and you get it all just so. And that's a really expensive process. Um, and the first couple of films I made, I found it incredibly stressful to be in a room with a guy, you know, it's usually a guy, um, for a very limited two or three day period and to be making decisions really quickly on the basis that there's a whirling taxi meter there, which is just running at an alarming rate. Um, so a number of years ago, I just said, okay, I'm just gonna study this myself and I'm just gonna figure it out. Um, and I just sat down over the course of several months and taught myself the software. Um, so I don't do the final mix myself. I still I have people that I can work with, but I understand the process and I can prepare it all for them. And I can, I can sort of talk to them on a certain level. Um, so, and that was, that's really valuable to me because handing something over and just going, you know, cause art, again, going back to communication, um, you, if you find yourself having to collaborate with somebody and if you don't, can't find the words for it, but you can, you can speak the language of the, the technical language of something, then that's a, a much better way to engage. You know what I mean? So, so I can work with sound people speaking that language and that's really useful. Um, so that, and I've kind of gone through the different aspects of filmmaking over the years, whether it's cameras or microphones or sound or whatever. And I've just gradually devoted myself to each one of them in turn. Um, again, and just being slightly stubborn about it. And, but I think that's that ability, not everybody, I have a fairly technical brain. And um, so not everybody can necessarily do that. Um, and I'm happy that I can, but I think that is a skill I've been very happy to have. So that, that's two. And then, yeah, but more than either of those um, is just uh, engaging with people. You know what I mean? Like it comes that ability to listen to people, to, to, you know, if it's, if, I mean, this sounds like a boast, but like I'm endlessly fascinated by humans and just asking people what they, what they get from something, what they like, you know, uh, or to interview them for a film or to work with them in a film. Like it's all about connection and, and just developing that kind of interpersonal thing um, is, is vital. I, I, it's impossible to imagine a world without that, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, there's three for you now. Drive. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think, I think society is very, to me, society is quite distinct from, um, 
the uh, say what would I say? You know, you've the, you've you've the media and the government and the up and the you know institutions of the state and um, organizations and civil society and and you've that level of more official done. And then you've humans, you know, which is just the people that you meet when you're out walking the dog um, and the people that you just generally engage with society, the society just of people. Um, and that latter is of far more interest to me. Um, and, and I think that society really values artists. I think that society um, really hold acknowledges and values um, that somebody would devote themselves to creating something that's not just about them and that is is about sharing especially if they like the work at all um, they don't necessarily want to be you because you're not exactly mega wealthy or anything um, and they don't want you to be mega wealthy um, but they value that you exist uh, and i think that's really really important so, and I think that encouragement comes, is, is very important to me. You know, I worked on a film called The Lonely Battle of Thomas Reed a couple of years ago with a friend of mine. Um, and it's a film about farming and, uh, and courtroom drama. And, but the fact that it's about a, a farmer, a, a kind of stubborn, independently minded farmer, um, means that it was very appealing when it went out on RT. It, it, it really captured the imagination, imagination of country people especially, and I'm a country person. Um, and I've never had a work, piece of work resonate with so many people. I've never had so many people from strange corners of my life, whether that's friends of my aunt in Burris, County Carlow, or um, my partner's father. Um, go, geez, I, I like that. Oh, he was brilliant. And uh, oh, how long did it take to do that now? You know, that kind of genuine, but there's a genuine respect that comes from, um, from people going, I'm glad that exists. And therefore, I'm glad that somebody took the time and effort to make it exist. And I find that incredibly fulfilling. Um, and I think that's to me, when you say, does society allow you to thrive? Yeah, I thrive on human connections. Um, I thrive on connecting myself with people, but also connecting people with each other. You know, when people can share, you go back to the idea of the cinema. I like the fact that my neighbor in Carlo and my partner's father in West Limerick both saw the same film that I made and, or worked on at least, and, and got it and liked it and thought, geez, I'm glad Tig exists. I really like that. Um, and I know it's a little bit self-centered, but it is when you'd ask about does it allow you to thrive yeah that that makes me uh it makes me happy um and and it's not about reviews in the paper it's not about necessarily a, a big financial reward but that kind of connection um with society in general is is i think what the power of art is you know um and uh and I think that's why why people appreciate it. I think that's why people value it because they, they see that themselves, you know. Well, my vast independent wealth has really helped. Um, <laughs> no, uh, what supports? Uh, people, like, I guess just people, you know, if you surround yourself by, if you surround yourself with people who share the same kinds of values, then you know, they, you get that kind of feedback and it's not even necessarily always a verbal thing. It could be a, just a look or a, how are you getting on? Is it all right? You know, any, you know, any movement on that thing. Um, just, yeah, I mean, people are the support that you need um, and that can come through a place like Visual where it's a load of people interconnected by a big, beautiful building in the middle of Carlow or it can be a much more ephemeral network of friends um, and, and collaborative people that you know within an industry. Um, so like, yeah, I can't think of any non-human supports I've put in place. Uh, no, not really. Like, um, like the, the relationships with funders and that kind of thing is something that comes with time and that you just have to work on. Um, I guess that's important. Uh, but that's kind of human as well. I suppose, but mm. I think if I were to say anything, last, last point on that, 
Um, and this is, I think, important to, the, to your subject. Um, I've always tried to represent my own work. I've always tried to maintain some kind of autonomy. Um, like filmmaking is all of, you know, producing is a big part of filmmaking and producing typically means that you have this person who operates as the, you know, the go between, between the money side of things and the making side of things. And I've always tried to produce my own work where possible um, because that allows me to, it's not about control, it's not about money, it's just about being seen in a certain way um, so that ultimately you can take responsibility up to a point. Um, and I think that applies, if I, was, if I were to encourage anybody in terms of how to put supports in place for your own work, so it was try and represent yourself. Nobody will represent your ideas in the way that you do. Um, and nobody will look out for you in the way that you do. And, and I think my own slight stubbornness of, of maintaining that position in relation to my own work um, has has been really important actually. Uh, so I think that's a better answer to that question. Um, I'm not sure if I'm best placed to talk about that. Um, okay. Because, because I didn't go to any kind of art uh, institution education wise, and I don't know that many people who did. Um, it might be just a coincidence, but most of the good filmmakers that I know, and I hope I'm not annoying anybody who I'm leaving out here, but a lot of the better filmmakers came from some other weird background. Um, and, and I think that I often find that life experience is, is a really undervalued thing when it comes to making art, especially art about the world. Um, so what could, what could higher education institutions do to better prepare people? Um, I, I genuinely don't know. Um, I think actually there is, I think, a tendency to, you know, and this goes back to our conversation uh, about competencies where I took you to task over the word opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I think there is a, when you bring too much business thinking into art, then the idea of identifying a market, as it were, and creating something for that market becomes a way of thinking. Um, where you say, oh, you know, what's really hot right now is, um, you know, uh, memoir in literature, you know, essays that are intercepted, intersected with uh, a reflection on your own life growing up in rural Ireland. And if anything miserable happened to you, then foreground that um because that's what's big right now and people go yeah I, I can i can do that um i think there is a degree of savviness that 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 is at play in that kind of art creation which is fundamentally dishonest it might not be dishonest but it's not honest i think the best art irrespective of the medium comes from an honesty, comes from a general fe a feeling here where you go, I feel something profound, I feel it's profound at least, and I would like to articulate it into the world. Um, and I don't know if anybody else feels that too, or if I'm just being a bit strange here, but that's, this is how I feel. And when I read a book or watch a film, I, can, I respond to honesty more than I respond to anything else. Uh, and to turn that on its head, I, I will close a book after 20 pages, if I feel that there's a dishonesty there, if somebody's trying to create an effect that's not, that's for, in order to sell more books or to, to do well, I'm just not interested. Um, so that's what I look for is that it's all about that human connection. So I think if it is the case, and I think it might be that higher education institutions encourage an awareness of opportunity, an awareness of what the market is, the market for certain types of work, if it is the case that higher education is encouraging people to think in that way, then please stop. Um, I think go back to just encouraging people to listen to themselves and to, to really, to, to just respond to their own honest feelings. Um, that would be my thing. I mean, look, I know people need to make a living. I know 
that there are trends in art and there's trends in selling stuff, but we're not here to talk about that. Like I acknowledge that exists and I know that it's, it's unrealistic to think otherwise, but I, I just certainly wouldn't encourage a young person to think in that way. They're getting it already from me, it's from social media. You know, young people especially are looking at what gets likes and they're replicating it. Whether that's driving a tractor with no hands on TikTok or uh, making certain kinds of jokes, they will see what does well and go after that. So social media has entirely taken over that as an engine of creativity. So higher education needs to acknowledge that social media is doing that and give an alternative um, mode of thinking. You know, where you encourage just switching off from what's out there and just going with what you feel yourself. Because like I say, if, you, if the two, you know, if life through social media and higher education through intellectual growth are telling you to just watch what's happening and, and tune into it and find a space for yourself in that, then you're just going to get a certain type of thing replicating itself. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> This has been the Zoom Room Sessions. This has been Tyg O'Sullivan. Tyg, if people want to find out more about your work, what is your website? What's your handles? Um, should they wish to, uh, you can find me on Twitter, which is just at Tyg O'Sullivan, T-A-D-H-G O'Sullivan. Um, and my website is tygosullivan.com. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a good bit of work on the website. Um, should you be interested? But Yep. There you Brilliant. Go. Um, you thanks for joining us on the show today, Doug. <laughs> My pleasure. Brilliant. <laughs>